time to kind of get more conscious and more skillful in oneself. And it's possible to do. This is the guided imagery. A lot of it is, is remedial education in how to use your mind and body to work together because you'll be happier and healthier if they, if they work together. And it's not weird stuff and it's not science it's not. fiction. There's more literature about mind-body medicine and its positive effects than any other field of medicine over the last 50 years. Welcome to Champions Mojo, a podcast to bring out your inner champion. Your hosts are sisters-in-law, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds national and world records in master swimming. Maria holds world records in endurance cycling and won the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. Both are certified health and life coaches. Our goal is to inspire you through conversations with champions. And now your host, Kelly Palace. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast, part of the CG Sports Network. We have an amazing show for you today, and I'm thrilled to be co-hosting with Maria Parker. Hey, Maria. How are you today, Kelly? Oh, Maria, I'm doing so great, and we have such a valuable show. We are going to be featuring a special guest, the renowned Dr. Martin Rossman, For nearly 50 years, Dr. Rossman has been teaching people to skillfully use their minds to release stress, relax the body, help with body healing, and solve uh, problems more creatively. He's written three popular books, numerous medical textbook chapters, co-founded a postgraduate training institute, and created a national PBS television show that reached over 4 million people. And that's the quick version of his resume. (laughs) Maria, can you share a little bit more about Dr. Rossman? Yes, Kelly, there's a lot to talk about. Dr. Rossman is an expert in mind-body medicine. He co-founded the Academy for Guided Imagery 30 years ago and has taught over 10,000 doctors, nurses, and therapists to utilize the powerful form of mind-body therapy called interactive guided imagery. Dr. Rossman is a longtime Marin physician and clinical fact faculty member at University of California, San Francisco. But you don't have to go to San Francisco to benefit from his large body of work as he has many online classes and tools, which can be found at the healingmind.org website. Well, that's right, Maria. And that's where you and I found Dr. Rossman through the healingmind.org website. And we both just finished a class that he has out there now for anxiety and stress called the three keys to calmness. Which is so, why we're going to be um, so fabulous today because we're yes, all calm. <laughs> we're, we're all we're all primed out of this class. It's it is a targeted, easy online class that teaches why, how, and when to use deep relaxation to support our mental and physical health. And it was very helpful for me, uh, and I know it was for you too. But whether you want to perform better in athletics uh, or your job or life, we guarantee you that today's show is going to give you some tools that you can use in these challenging times. So without further delay, uh, let's welcome Dr. Rossman to the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yes, welcome. Welcome. Well, we are we're going to just start out with kind of the obvious question, which is, uh, what are your thoughts on the increased anxiety and stress around the pandemic. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for people to be anxious. Let's put it that way. And, it's, uh, <laughs> and so that I that would make it a great opportunity to learn how to manage anxiety because the stakes are really high. It's you know there's uh, there's real things to worry about, but also a lot of those things are not helped by worrying about them. And so it really behooves people to learn how to separate out um, what I call good worry from bad worry. My last book was called The Worry Solution. And a lot of it revolves around the benefits of worry as a problem solving mechanism. I I believe that uh, that worry, which is thinking about things you don't want to have happen, thinking about issues and problems and how to solve them, is an adaptive feature of the human imagination. You know, our our imagination lets us think about things in the future. It lets us think about, "Mm, I don't want that to happen to me, so what do I need to do to avoid that? That's a really useful thing to do. It's adaptive, it protects our lives, which is 
basically the number one function of the brain. The number one function of the brain is keep you alive. Everything else is kind of secondary and, and tertiary and below that in nature. So it's always looking for danger. It's always looking for problems, even when none exist. And it has a capability of being very creative and making stuff up and, you know, and, and amplifying worries, which is something that people who tend to be anxious uh, tend to develop as a habit. And we can talk about, about why that happens. But getting better at the problem-solving nature of the imagination is really worthwhile and being able to separate out the things that you can't do anything about that's what i call bad worry where no matter how much you want to and no matter how important it is to you you just can't do anything practical about it you know what you can you can pray about it and you can intend about it and you can use you can learn how to use your imagination instead of going over and over and over all the things you don't want to see happen, which makes you anxious. We, we know that there's a ton of research that that shows if you just show people pictures and videos and movies about stuff that is scary, they get more and more anxious. That's of course. So you don't want to be unconsciously in the habit of showing yourself these mental movies of what you don't want to, you know, if you're running a race, you don't want to be focusing on tripping and falling as you're coming down the stress. If you're the stretch, if you're the classic one in sports is, you know, if you're teeing off and there's a lake to your right, mm -hmm. you don't <laughs> want to be visualizing hitting the ball in the lake which is what most people do, even though what they think they're doing is thinking that they don't want to hit the ball in the lake. The thing is, the way imagery works, there is no image for not hitting the ball in the lake. And if you're thinking about the lake, you're much more likely to hit the ball in the lake. Just like if you're skiing down a slope at high speed, you don't want to be looking at the tree that you don't want to hit. You want to be looking at the line that you want to ski that goes between the trees because what you look, you're much more likely to go where your eyes look. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you're much more likely to go where your inner vision looks. So that's a discipline that people have to have to learn when they want to perform at a very high level in sports. And that discipline is something we all need to learn now when there's so much bad news, so many scary things. The media makes its money by getting you to watch it and nothing gets you to watch things like stuff that's scary. It, and again, it goes back to the number one job of the brain is to protect your life. So it is obligated to look at stuff that's dangerous and scary. So they love to you know, use the surges and spikes and big numbers <laughs> and horrible images. And, you know, it's not that we don't need to know about that stuff, but you don't need to drill it into your mind 24 seven. You don't need to go to sleep dreaming about it. You have to, this is a time when people really need to learn how to use their imagination skillfully, because if you let it run wild, if you don't use your imagination skillfully. It's like having a very powerful, very spirited horse that's untrained that is very likely to injure you if you don't befriend it and don't train it and don't work out a working relationship with it. It's very, imagination is very powerful, but there are skills to be learned with the imagination that almost nobody gets trained in. It's not part of what school used to be reading and writing and arithmetic. You know, school isn't even that anymore. School, now it's virtual, but before it was virtual, it was just about trying to keep kids from hurting each other. It used to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was not about imagining and intending and goal setting and motivation and learning how to calm yourself in a stressful situation, all of which, as you know, are are critical to sports performance and really any performance in life is business performance, but they're also now 
really critical in just getting through your day without freaking out. So Dr. Rossman, yeah, I would love for you to answer this question. So I have a, a good friend of mine who is a runner and she runs every day and she went out for a run and she started having real shortness of breath for the first time in ages. Like she just said, she's never had shortness of breath. And she was sure when she came back, you know, she's got COVID-19. So what, when, when we get the common cold or we get not COVID-19, but we get the flu, how, what do we need to do initially when we're just like flipped out? Oh my gosh, this is the, this is the end. I've got COVID-19. What, what do we say to that wild bucking horse? <laughs> we that say, why don't you call your doctor and get tested? <laughs> I mean, get tested because with those symptoms in a healthy person, uh, you'd be silly not to think about that, not to consider that. So what you have to do is you have to talk with your doctor and you, you need to get tested if at all possible. If you want to play it safe, I mean, the way that I work with my patients, many of my patients are already set up with kind of a home medicine cabinet of uh, supplements. Some of them are, are nutritional supplements like vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc lozenges, things that we uh, know help the immune system and show some evidence of being helpful in fighting off early viral illnesses. And also, because I'm not only a medical doctor, I'm also uh, an acupuncturist and I'm trained in Chinese medicine. Uh, I've supplied many of my patients uh, whom it's appropriate for with, uh, with a kit of Chinese herbal supplements that they can take, which have been researched in China, and which also are quite safe to take and which show some benefit in, especially in early illness. Well, all these things are typically very safe. They don't represent uh, a risk because they're all very good companies that follow good manufacturing practices and they're not contaminated. So they're, they're quite safe. The risk is quite low. The benefits are somewhere between possible and likely. And then they also know to take those symptoms as a sign to get quiet. Um, almost all of my patients have been trained in the ability to deeply relax because it allows your body to go into this opposite state to the fight and fight or flight response, which, which colloquially we call the rest and digest response, which, a which is a state in which your body can do what it needs to do in order to best defend itself. So they know to do that. So I would say for your friend, you want to get medically checked out. You don't want to stick your head in the sand and not get checked out. And then you want to focus on things that support your health, eating well. You wouldn't want to be drinking alcohol during that period. You wouldn't want to be smoking anything. Um, you wouldn't be wanting to run yourself ragged. Maybe your body is tired. Maybe you want to take a few days off. Maybe you're overtraining if you're running the same amount every day. And we know that overtraining is just as bad as undertraining. And colds and flus and respiratory illnesses are uh, one common sign of overtraining. So you want to listen to your body, pull back, get more rest, get more sleep, eat especially well, also get tested. And if you are nutritionally aware or herbally aware and have access to resources like that, you want to employ those. And at the same time, I would have uh, ever learn how to do a deep relaxation and kind of talk with her immune system and cheer it on and ask it if there's any, and ask her if the, ask it, I mean, this sounds kind of silly, but we do this kind of internal imagery dialogue all the time where you'd relax, you'd go to an internal healing place, which is a safe, beautiful place that you feel good to be in. You might invite an image to come for your immune system or the, the foreman of your immune system or the forewoman or whoever's in charge. And so you say, what's going on? Is there something I can do to help out here and, and move from there? And those are things that I, that I teach all my patients. And I try to teach as many people as possible through the Healing Mind website and, and the kind of course you mentioned, the deep relaxation course. What do you do until you get the COVID-19 test back for, for 
four days because some people say it takes two weeks to get it back. So if you're just going crazy with every symptom thinking, you know, I've got this, what would be the first thing to do? Well, here's the question. Does it do you any good to worry about it? Okay, so when you think about it, it, the good that worrying about it does is gets you to call your doctor, gets you to rest, gets you to clean up your diet if you if it needs cleaning, gets you to, to work on your stress, because those are the things that you can do about it. You know, if you work through the worry solution program, uh, if you're reading my book and you work through that, you would make a list of the things that you're worrying about and you would separate out the things that you can't do anything directly about. And uh, I teach a a technique which is so simple as to be inane really, but it really works well and it's called positive worry imagery. And so what, what what it does is you take that worry like, oh, my God, I've got it. I'm going to die a horrible death by myself. Um, <laughs> you know, painful, alone, horrible, you know, mm-hmm. and just like amplify that all, you know, which is an attempt to come to terms with it. But it doesn't really help you. So you would take that. You'd become aware of that and that there's that you've called the doctor, you've cleaned up your act, you're resting more, you know, you're doing everything that you can, uh, you're talking to your immune system, and you would turn it on its head, and you would turn it into learning how to imagine, whether it's visualization or, or um, 3D technicolor, stereo imagination of, I've got, I'm a strong person. I have a strong immune system, fully capable of eliminating whatever this is from my system. I'll get more rest for a few days and I'll get better, just like I have from every other illness I've ever had in my life, Mm -hmm. which is a nice thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you find the fears rising, because the scary imagery is coming from your fears, totally normal. Uh, here's the silly part, but it works. I teach people, you know, imagine once you recognize that your fears are rising, you imagine a red circle with a red slash through it, like a no smoking sign or no parking sign or no whatever sign. You mentally stamp it, you move it out of your mind, and you move in your new image, which is you in a couple of days, feeling better, getting back on your feet, starting to work out again, starting to get back, recovering fully and completely again, like you have from every other illness that you have in your life. The interesting thing about that, it's called positive worry imagery. And that guided imagery is actually available for free as are probably a dozen others on the healingmind.org. If you go there, there's a little orange banner at the top free resources for COVID-19 anxiety. And so I've made a bunch of the most helpful guided imageries available. There's no charge to anybody, share them with anybody you want. And the positive worry imagery is on there. And it's remarkable how quickly it can change the way you feel and turn that stress down and then kind of start turning it off. And you start to get in the habit then of being able to turn those habitual worries around because the people who I call habitual bad worriers who go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, have just learned a bad habit. And it's possible, you know, you can learn a good habit pretty much just as easily as you can learn a bad habit. It's just that, you know, by the time you're an adult, you've, you've gotten habitual about your bad worry about, 100 million times. So uh, it's going to take a while for you to develop this new habit, but it doesn't take 100 million times. It probably takes about two or three dozen times. And then you go, oh, I don't have to do that. I don't have to be a slave to my imagination. I don't have, I can, it's something that I can learn how to use and I can be I can develop skill, I can develop mastery, I can start to turn it off when it's not taking me to a good place. And then you start visualizing what you want to see over and over and over, and you start to feel good about that, and you start to feel more 
more relaxed. So that's a skill you can learn to use. I, I first learned that from a wonderful friend and colleague of mine, Rachel Naomi Remen, who's a physician who's written several wonderful books and who treated a lot of people with cancer as I have, basically working with their attitude and mind-body game in the face of cancer. And it I was just shocked at how well it worked with cancer patients who, as you imagine, especially in the newly diagnosed stages where these fears come up from what they read, what they think, the cancer's the boogeyman, just now COVID's the boogeyman now, with a lot more PR um, than, <laughs> than can, cancer ever got, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. Um, true. Yeah, so uh, that's the, when the boogeyman comes up, so it's like, you really need to separate out, is this a real boogeyman? Are there things I can do to protect myself from it? including turning off my runaway fears because mm -hmm. they're not helping me. They're just amplifying my stress response, which right now is not helping me because I, I cannot directly kill it or outrun it or fight it, which is what that fight or flight response is designed to do. So I need to, again, I know you're, that a lot of your listeners are athletes and those are wonderful examples and metaphors it's just like you know when you get to that starting line and you you kind of want to have a little bit of anxiety you want to have about a two to three out of a ten level of excitement you want to be like that horse at the starting gate you want to have some adrenaline flowing because it's going to help you but if you're an eight or a nine on a ten scale you might you might, you might fall asleep on your face out of the starting box, <laughs> yeah. you might fall start, you know, yeah, I've been not, there. <laughs> we've all been there. We've yeah. all been there. And you can't breathe, you know, you right. can't control your mind. You don't you can't know feel what, your feet. <laughs> you can't feel your feet. You don't know what you, so as you know, once an athlete gets to a certain level of physical conditioning, you know, when we talk about elite athletic performance, just like elite musical performance, acting performance, business performance. But in athletic performance, once you get to a certain level, it's not about your body anymore. It's about your mind. And that is what separates the truly great from, from the well-conditioned, you know, is, is that they have learned how to use their mind. They've learned how to focus. They have learned how to breathe. They have learned how to modulate the stress level and the intention level and the goal levels and they've been able to find that place so those lessons are well used if you've developed them for athletic performance they're well used for health performance as well and it is kind of a performance that that brings that brings me to a question about you know that we have the practice you know as athletes we have the practice of working out and we have the practice of nutrition and a lot of us have developed a, a mental practice too and, and what you teach is very simple and very doable. How come people don't teach their kids this? You know, I mean, I look at my, even my grandchildren who are, you know, I see them stressed out and why, you know, how can we help everyone develop this third really important practice for good health? Exactly. It should be taught very early in life. And uh, just before your show came on, I attended my five-year-old grandson's uh, graduation from primary uh, preschool. Uh, so he'll be going to kindergarten. But two years ago, no, last year, they invited me into the classroom, which were three and four-year-olds. And I taught them a simple breathing technique, which is you breathe in, you imagine that you climb up the uh, the mountain and you breathe out and you slide down the mountain and you relax. And these kids had already been exposed to it. And so they talked about their relaxation breathing and they talked mm. about their, uh, what their teachers had told them they were called an inner help, an inner helper, which is a figure that's loving and kind and that they can go and talk to their inner helper if they get, have a problem or if they're emotionally upset and it can help them out. So these kids are on their way. They're going to, they know this stuff before kindergarten and that's where we should teach it. But it's, even though I've been in this field and 
learning about and teaching it for 50 years, and even though it's much more widely known and accepted, and with the mindfulness movement and John Kabat-Zinn's wonderful work, and so many, and yoga being as popular as it is, and so much mind-body education, I think it's still in the minority. It's still not a daily practice. You know, Americans are still like, what more can I do? And, and how much more time can I spend trying to get ahead or um, now we're down to survival as opposed to achievement. And so it, it is a good time to learn these things because they're very, very basic survival techniques that in a, a more natural world are very natural to us. You know, if you think about our, our ancestors living in a non-technological, tribal, nature-filled world, it's not go, 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 go all the time, 24 seven. It's like, let's go find some food. Let's make the food. Let's, let's skin the bison and make clothes for the winter. And let's uh, learn how to hunt and let's prepare for war. It's not that they didn't have stress, but they didn't have stress 24 seven. They weren't tuned into MSNBC 24 seven right. or right. Fox news or whatever your preference that is basically featuring all the bad stuff from all over the world all the time. That's something that the human mind has never had to process before. And we have to learn mental hygiene skills to separate these things out. All of these, all these skills are kind of the same separating out what's useful, what's actionable from what is not, how do I deal with what is not, what I can't do anything about, how do I let go, how do I turn it into a prayer, how do I turn it into an intention, uh, and how do I act on those things that I can do something about, how do I plan, how do I motivate myself, how do I keep track, um, those are the essential skills. And, they're very, very useful now, and anybody who learns them now will have them the rest of their lives, whether you're three years old or you're 65 years old. It's not too late to learn. Dr. Rossman, your healingmind.org website, uh, today we're talking so far initially a lot about anxiety, but can you go over, like, if, if you go to your website and pull up products, there are so many great products on everything from pain relief to dealing with cancer to women's health to childbirthing to anxiety and stress. Like, so I, I think it's phenomenal that you have free uh, resources for COVID-19 worries. So what, what else is on your website that could help our listeners? And I would just add that it's all very affordable. You don't, oh, you're, my gosh. It's, it's so it's reasonable. It's incredibly reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's so reasonable. So people don't have to be think, oh, I can't, you know, it's it's great. I've, I've already downloaded and paid for several things because it's so affordable and I want it all. <laughs> it's pretty cheap considering yeah. that, you know, when you, you know, your mind is clearly the most underutilized health resource there is, you know, Um so it's pretty inexpensive. Thank you for that, you know. Um, true. And I want to keep it. Um, part of my mission for the 50 years has been how do I teach people skills that they should have learned in kindergarten, but they didn't. And just simple skills to reduce stress because stress is at the root of probably 80 to 85 percent of all the chronic illness that not only affects um, the majority of people in our culture but where we spend 80 to 90 percent of the what's called the so-called health care budget which is really not a health care budget it's a medical care budget um, and if we practice good health care and good self-care you know, probably 80% of that 80% would go away. And a lot of it, the root of it is poorly managed stress and emotions, which we have never been taught. We are, unfortunately, a, a largely an emotionally illiterate culture. We, part of it comes because we come from so many different places. We don't have 
you know, if you grow up in a culture like a European culture or a traditional Asian culture or some kind of indigenous culture, I'm not saying we'd want to trade our lifestyle for that, but there are aspects that we would because they have well-worn paths for dealing with anger, for dealing with sadness, for dealing with mm. grief, for dealing... You may want to argue with those ways and say that you have better ways and you're you know, your, your Jewish ways are better than their Islam ways or, our, or your Christian ways are better than the Buddhist ways or the Buddhist ways are better than the whatever. But if you grow up in a more monolithic culture, you've got well-worn paths for dealing with that. And when, when difficult things happen as they do in life, you have family, you have a village, you have ways to process those emotions. Where here, it's just like every man and woman for him. I mean, the American ideal is everybody for themselves, the rugged individual. I can pave my own, I can, you know, pave my own path. I can, um, I can shoot it out with the next guy, you know, and we're, what we're experiencing in the culture is, I hope, the, the far end of that, you know, where, what it comes down to, if our values are every person for themselves and every person against everybody else. And I'm hoping that we can swing back to a more, no, we're in it together. We do need villages. We need each other. We're social animals. We need to take care of ourselves. And But a lot of it begins with the individuals learning how to manage their fear, manage their anger, manage their their sadness. And by manage, I don't mean make it all go away. I mean, live with it in a healthy way um, and not freak out and panic and amplify it and project it on other people and take it out on other people all the time. That's what we do. And as a culture, what do we do to manage stress? We eat junk food. We eat too much because it numbs us. We drink too much alcohol, we smoke too much weed, we take too many prescription medications. This is the illness of America. So we have, so we're overweight, we have diabetes type two, we have high blood pressure, we have heart disease. So I think these are all ways that we're just trying to get through the day. You know, I started my practice out in poor urban setting, because that's who I wanted to help. And um, did house call practices and free clinics in those settings and tried to understand why why is everybody drinking too much and drugging too much and taking too much medicine and smoking too much and weighing 300 pounds. And when I did my house call practice, I found out it's, it's way too stressful and people are just trying to get through the not only the day, the next hour. And these things all provide temporary comfort. And if they weren't toxic to the body, fine. You know, to, I'd still be smoking two packs of camels a day oh my gosh. If, it, if it didn't make me sick. Um, you know, if I hadn't been coughing till I was blue in the face and embarrassing all my, you know, myself and my friends when I was 30 years old. So I finally came to like, mm, maybe my body's trying to tell me something here. I am a doctor. I should I certainly <laughs> know better, but I had to start learning how to manage my emotions better and learn how to manage my stress better. And fortunately, was able to do that. And that was part of why I'm as passionate as I am about teaching people healthier ways of coping. You know, um, if it didn't make people sick as a doctor, I don't care what you do. You know, I'm not a, it's not a moral thing, but it, those things create lung disease, heart disease, pancreatic disease, digestive disease, dementia, you know, every illness that we spend fortunes trying to manage with pharmaceuticals, which are only fingers in the dike. They don't cure anything. If they cured something, they, these wouldn't be chronic diseases. So I'm not sure how far I've strayed from your question. No, I, I, oh, it's, great. it's been fabulous. It's yeah. Do you, yeah. do you have any stories of real success stories or any stories? We, we love stories. They're great for listening uh, that stick out in your mind that you can think of someone that really turned their life around or really embraced your techniques. I better have after 50 years. The, 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 the trouble is there's so, well, yeah. so many of them that there's, 
there's no longer any that, uh, you know, that stick out above the others. There's probably thousands. But yeah, I think my patients and I think a lot of the people who've read my books and listened to my audios are big part of the message is that your body is very intelligent and it sends, it sends you signals. And the signals are meant to get your attention because it needs your attention in order to modify something that you're doing that may be hurting it or making it tired or making it feel nervous and making it sick. And if you learn how to pay attention to those signals better, we were all taught, you know, in my generation who grew up in the 50s, we were all taught, you know, to pay attention to pain and sores that don't stop bleeding and there were like seven warning signs of cancer and basically any symptom you had you were taught to pay attention to it but what they all meant was call your doctor there's still a wisdom to that if you've got a persistent symptom that you can't figure out and that self-care measures don't address that's what your doctor's for you should call your doctor But we were never taught to, well, why don't you get quiet and kind of spend a few quiet moments with yourself and see what may be going on. Nobody ever taught that to us. The body, and and that includes medical school, where you come out of medical school having studied, you don't study people in medical school. You don't study nutrition. You don't study psychology. You study diseases in medical school. So you come out of medical school feeling like people are walking time bombs, basically. (laughs) Uh, Like, yeah, you might be okay now, but just wait. And um, because that's what you've studied for four years is how to recognize diseases. And it's a big oversight that we don't study health. We don't study the miracle that people are. Um, and how to nourish that and how to support good health. Holistic doctors, now integrative doctors, and some other health practitioners, good nutritionists, naturopathic doctors, exercise coaches, you know, health coaches study health and they can help people learn healthy behaviors and habits that that will minimize your need for doctors, not eliminate it because even the healthiest people stuff happens to eventually. It just happens a lot less frequently and it happens without regularity, you know, whereas if people, uh, so yeah, there've been a lot of people who come in and I don't know why this is happening to me. And I teach them to use these guided imagery methods, which start with the ability to relax your body, quiet your mind and listen in this special way, which imagery allows us to do, invite an image. There's a process called listening to your symptom that I teach, allow an image to come to mind and, and um, you know, ask it if it's got a message for you. Why is it there? Is it trying to tell you something? Does it need something from you? Does it want something from you? Is it trying to help you in some way that you don't understand? So, so one story uh, of that kind of imagery kind of complex as I worked with a woman one time in her 50s. She'd had chronic forearm and arm pain for about three years that nobody could diagnose or treat. Resisted every kind of pain treatment, physical therapy, um, exercise treatment, acupuncture, every modality, pain medications, anti-inflammatories, massage, all that kind of stuff, nothing could treat. And she worked with me, she actually did a demonstration with me and when we were training health professionals to use this method. And so I led her through, a, she was a student, so it was kind of easy for her. She led her through a little relaxation, she got quiet, invited her to go to a safe place in her mind, which she did. I said, focus directly on the pain and just let an image come to mind that can tell you something useful about that pain. And you don't even know what that image is. Don't try to make it up, just let it bubble up. And she was quiet for a minute. She says, I I get, I don't know what this means, but I get these black iron rods that are the shape of the pain. So I said, great, and tell me more about the iron rods. Tell me what kind of, what do you notice about them? She says, well, they're very rigid, they're very hard, they're very cold. They're very unbending. I kept urging her, you know, what other qualities do they have? So they were stiff, they were cold, they were rigid, they were unbending. 
I said, how do you feel towards them? She says, well, I don't like them being there. I, I don't know why they're there. I said, well, mentally just ask them to give you some information about why they're there. And she sits for a minute. You have to be quiet. You have to let it unfold, which is hard for a lot of people, especially if they're anxious, but you can do it. And she says, you know, my grandfather's coming to mind. And I said, tell me about your grandfather, how he looks now. And she says, well, he was a very stern man in his older age. He was a preacher and he's wearing all black and he's got a white collar. And I took care of him for the last three years of his life because there was nobody else in my family. And I was glad to do it, but he was, and then she stopped and she said, he was very rigid and cold and unbending. And it was not easy to take care of him. He was very critical. And so we went into that a little bit. And I said, well, how do you feel towards him now? She starts to cry. She says, you know, I really loved him, but he was very hard to be with. He was very, he was judgmental. He was harsh. He, like she said before, he, he had the same qualities as these iron bars, hard, strong, rigid, cold, unbending, unyielding. And she starts to cry for a while, let her cry. I said, well, how does he look now to you? And she says, you know, he's looking at me with this, his eyes are like warm and loving. I never saw them like that while he was alive. So I said, well, maybe he's different now. I don't know. And what would you like to say to him? She tells me she wants to tell him that she did the best she could and that she, she loved him and she's still crying. There's a lot of crying that goes on in healing because a lot of it is emotional. It does, not always crying, but there's a lot of emotions involved in both illness and healing. And in her mind's eye, he looks at her and he's very warm and loving and he comes over and he tells her in her mind that he knows how much she loved him and that he appreciated her care and he knows that she did everything for him. And, and he was just unable to tell her that. He never knew how to express his softer side. And everybody's crying by this time. I'm crying. We're crying. Everybody yeah, we're You're crying. crying. <laughs> we're crying. Hopefully your listeners are crying. <laughs> Not because we want to make people cry, but it's, it's deeply emotional. touching. It's yes. emotional. And she, he didn't know how to process her, his emotions. She didn't know what to do with those emotions because they were mixed. Sadness and anger and hurt. And so we ended up that session and she opened her eyes and we talked about it a little bit. And it's pretty obvious how those two things are related, you know. But those are not things. And she was... She was 50% relieved of pain when after this 20-minute session. And she went on to work with a guided a therapist that knew guided imagery for about the next two or three months, did a lot deeper grieving. Her pain went away, as it, as it often does. Well, we have an epidemic of chronic pain in America. And chronic pain is defined by the pain specialist as pain that no longer has a a message value. In other words, you're not still sitting on the thumbtack that's causing pain in your behind. I disagree with that. And I think this case history is a very clear illustration that the pain may have a message value. It may not be a physical injury. It may be an emotional wound or pain that never really gets well dealt with or directly dealt with. And if you do learn how to do it, it's something that can be addressed and healed. And it's not something that will ever show up on an x-ray. It will never show up in an MRI or a CT scan. It will not show up by laboratory tests. There's a great deal of emotional pain in life, even in the best lives. There's a great deal of emotional pain in our time. Um, and again, growing up in uh, a relatively emotionally illiterate culture where we're not educated. And nobody I know was ever educated in how to deal with emotions, how to tell people if they're hurting you, how to assert yourself, how to grieve. These are just things you, you get the best that you can from your parents and your family and maybe your, your religion or maybe as an adult you 
you find it through therapy or psychology or a spiritual path, you know, but if, if you don't, then you just, you just try to tamp it down and do the best you can. And you make, um, so we're trying to do a lot of emotional healing education here. Sometimes the messages are physical. I've had people get messages about their pain, like, um, had a wonderful factory worker, big beer belly, had chronic back pain on disability. Everybody in their mother had told them, you know, you're, you got this big beer, beer belly and sway back and you're not going to get better till you start getting in condition, lose some weight and start exercising. And he was a neat guy and we had a nice rapport and I was able to, um, because I, I worked my way through medical school working in factories and breweries and bars and driving buses and stuff. So I have a soft spot for working people and my family was working people. And so we were able to hit it off. So he was even willing to do some guided imagery. And when he looked at his back, I said, let an image come up for your back. And he got this old mule with this huge sway back, you know, and, um, we got into a little talk with the mule and the mule said, well, I've been carrying a heavy load my whole life and I carry it cause that's what I do. And uh, it's broken my back. And he didn't exactly start to cry, but he choked up and we started talking about that. And we ended up talking for how long he'd work, why he'd worked. He was, you know, he'd, He'd brought up a family, he'd raised kids, he'd sent them for an education, he took care of his friends and relatives. He was a neat guy, he was a pillar of the community. But he just kept his pain and his burden to himself. And so, and the way he did that was after work, he had a few beers and he ate comfort food from his ethnic background, which was, and he'd done enough work for the day. So he didn't exercise and he didn't stretch and he certainly didn't do yoga. I mean, he'd done his work and he kind of took it easy and he got a big sway back and it hurt. And we actually were able to get him hooked up with a good physical therapist and modified his diet. He did better. His back pain didn't go. He had a, I mean, the man was 65 years old and his back was already pretty bad. He got a lot happier. That's amazing. Those are amazing stories. I was going to say, I don't know if you know that uh, Maria and I are sisters-in-law, and we're uh, Maria's married to my brother. And when we've gone through different counselings in our lives, we said our family only had two emotions, and that was hungry and horny. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I remember presenting Jim a big list of feeling words, uh, you know, at some, at some point in counseling. And he's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Certainly we are, certainly men are not taught to do that. We're just, we're, we're taught to stuff it. And we typically stuff it inside, you know? And um, so there's been a lot of stuffing and it's time to kind of get more conscious and more skillful in oneself and, it's possible to do. This is the guided imagery. A lot of it is, is remedial education in how to use your mind and body to work together because you'll be happier and healthier if they, if they work together and it's not weird stuff and it's not science it's not. fiction. There's more literature about mind body medicine and its positive effects than any other field of medicine over the last 50 years. Um, it just means taking stock, taking some responsibility and saying, hey, I'm, I'm more stressed than I want to be. Uh, maybe I'm more stressed than I need to be. And uh, as you mentioned, right now we're offering a course called The Three Keys to Calmness, which teaches people the basics of how to deeply relax your body and mind. You know, that's my newest attempt to make it simple for people. If I can teach a four-year-old I can probably teach you, no matter what your age is. I, I would just add that this is not difficult stuff. It's very simple and very effective, immediately effective. If you go through, you know, one session through with these recordings with Dr. Rossman, it will change you and you will see the benefit of it. Yeah, you can notice the difference. And it's one thing, 
you know, one of the, a lot of people are sort of interested in meditation and mindfulness, which I'm a big fan of. This is not a criticism in any way, but a lot of people don't do that well with it because a lot of people don't do that well with it because it's kind of abstract and it takes a while to notice benefit. Yeah. Whereas the deep body relaxation, the three keys to calmness, which are abdominal breathing, going through your body, progressive muscle relaxation, and a simple guided imagery about being in a place you love to be, you generally feel it the very first time you do it and then you develop skills. Dr. Rossman, if you want a, a testimonial or a story for the future, and then I know we got to let you go soon. I went through, a, like within a month, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, lost a home we just built in a hurricane, and my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and was really causing our family. So we had kind of a oh trifecta my. of stress. And I was literally climbing the walls with panic attacks and anxiety and thought I was losing my mind. And I went to the healingmind.org. I downloaded several of, I think some of them were free. And I immediately felt stress. Like I literally was just in a, in a, in a panic mode for days. I could not get my cortisol down. And I, I listened to your beautiful voice and yes, his voice the, is beautiful. you know, the relaxation techniques and it, it truly instantly brought me back. And my husband, I walked out of my room and he's like, what, what happened to you? And I said, <laughs> Dr. Martin Rossman, he is the man. So thank you for all you've done yes, for me personally, yes. for all the people out there. And I know we've kept you just a hair over your time, but um, we always ask the last question. Is there anything we haven't covered that you would want to share with our listeners? Yeah, tons. <laughs> go, go to his website. I lost it. But thank you very much for sharing that. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Uh, you got me choked up now because that's what it's all about is uh, teaching people how to help themselves and so that they can teach other people and that they can help themselves. The, the more skilled we are, the more powerful we are, uh, the more responsible we can be, the more we can not only take care of ourselves, but others. And that's really what it's all about. So thank you for, for having me here. I'd be happy to come back at some time because there's really is a lot more. Oh, it would be so great. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so very much. much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. 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 Takeaways, takeaways, takeaways. We've heard from you that your favorite section of our podcast is the takeaways. Thank you so much for that feedback. But before we get to the takeaways today, we wanted to ask you if you would please give us a five-star review. That way, more people will be able to find our podcast. Also, if you could subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, you'll never miss a podcast episode if you subscribe. And please share our podcast with your friends. And now, the takeaways. So, Maria, wow. Had us both in tears for our first video. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I've been soaking in all things Dr. Rossman since uh, I learned we were going to uh, interview him. And this man may be one of the most important people in our country right now if he can be effective in trying to do what he's doing. I guess what I'm trying to say is what he's doing is so important and so easy. And, you know, I'm excited to share this. Yes, yes. Truly, he's he's way ahead of his time. You know, we, we as athletes right. have been using guided imagery for decades right. in right. manifesting results that we want as an athlete. But what if we could do right. that as, you know, just everyday people manifesting better health, lack of disease, right? You know, it's, it's so valuable. Well, and even as athletes, we get stressed out about life and other things. And I think we forget that we can use these techniques in everything. Yeah. And I'm really excited to teach these techniques to my grandkids because I, you know, I see them, they are already experiencing fear and stress. And we live in a world like, you know, he said, you know, it's adaptive. Worry is adaptive. It's something like, you know, if there's a tiger, you better get away, right. you know, kind of adaptive. But in, in our day and age right now, we live in a constant uh, and our environment is filled with scary things. It's like we had somebody whispering in our ear 24 seven, 
There's something to be scared right around the corner, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, news organizations. Oh my gosh, something bad's going to happen. Oh my gosh, you know, like he said, the word spike, you know, they're, they're so, we are constantly exposed to terrifying things because that's what sells. You know, that's what you click on because you're adapted to do that. And so, you know, in this day and age, we, you know, this kind of stuff is so necessary. The ability to learn to control where our mind goes and what happens to our body when we feel stress. Yes, it's truly like when he said that, uh, you know, cancer doesn't have as big of a PR agent. I thought that yeah, was so hilarious, true. you know, just, you know, when when you get a cancer diagnosis, which you know about from right. your sister right. and I know about from me, you know, you're not at least bombarded. I mean, you are bombarded with some of the negative, but not like we're hearing today with all that's going on. Right. Yeah. So, so Maria, yeah. What, what is your first main takeaway? Well, it was something that I learned before we even talked to him, but as he talked to him, it solidified that this is a practice that's easy to do and so important, but you know, that, that it's, you know, he called it a discipline, but I think it's just something that's really, really easy and quick and can have huge, huge impacts on our health, physical health. So my first takeaway would be, it's not that hard and it's so important. Yes. What about you? My first takeaway, I, I love that he said, you know, people who are chronic warriors, chronically looking, you know, thinking about the negatives in life, we, and, I, and I'm one of them, uh, have been doing it millions of times, that it's just really a bad habit. Oh, I love and that. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, and that it, it, he said it doesn't take a million reversals right. to correct it, that right. it only takes maybe three dozen. Right. So that's really encouraging. That is encouraging. That is encouraging. And yeah, so, and then my second takeaway would be that, you know, what did he say? 80% of, you know, of, of illness, you know, is really a, a mind body thing that we can manage with this, these very simple techniques and exercises. I think, that's so important to, to know. And, you know, we do this in health coaching and I've actually done this with my clients, but, you know, I, I think I'm going to put an even bigger emphasis on it because just the idea that you can, you know, listen to your body and listen to your discomfort and figure out, you know, what, you know, what it is and what the message is there. For. So I, I love that uh, idea that you know, this is so important. <laughs> and, it, and if we all could learn these techniques, uh, national healthcare spending would go way down. Yes. Yeah. There, there was just, there's so much there. I think my second main takeaway would be that it's, you know, it's easy that it's just, it's not that hard. Like I I told in my little testimonial that you can really change, turn things around quickly if you grab a hold of it. Yeah. So I, I, I was so, you know, encouraged when I very first found his website many years ago. I mean, yeah, this was years ago. I think I ago. remember, because I remember sitting in my driveway talking to you and you're like, I found this thing and I feel better right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that was yeah, when things so, were really awful in your life in terms of yeah, external just, stress. Yeah. External stressors were off, out of the, you know, off the charts. But um, yeah, and, and there are some free resources. Right. I think that's what's super cool. Um, that, you know, he's not out there to make millions. No, believe he me. really wants to change just, the world. Yeah. 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 So that, that's great. Well, great. Maria. Awesome. Great to see your beautiful face here. <laughs> I love seeing and, your uh, face too, Kelly. I love yes. you. So I love you too. We'll talk on the next one. Okay. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye. This week's quote of the week comes to us from Dr. Martin Rossman. Your imagination is very powerful. Untrained, it can injure you. You must learn to train it like a stallion, guide it, befriend it, and make it work for you. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cabra Media, and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.